Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Lynch. I'm a consultant working with the Institute of Leadership and Management and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on ownership time management. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Arwin Wilcock. She's the research manager at the Institute of Leadership and Management. Arwin is an experienced researcher, manager, trainer, teacher, and facilitator who has a passion for bringing research to life by applying research findings in everyday practice. Arwin has five degrees and a PhD and an MBA, which is an awful lot of studying. Um, and she's put her many qualifications into practice during her very career, um, which has included being a lab-based research scientist, a secondary school science teacher, and working on a range of complex research and clinical innovation projects in the healthcare sector. So Arwin is very well placed, I think, given that very broad experience to talk to us today about ownership and time management. Arwin, can I hand over to you? Thank you for the introduction. So uh, the Institute of Leadership and Management, um, we identify five dimensions for great leadership, namely authenticity, vision, achievement, ownership and collaboration. And within these dimensions, we've identified 49 components that we focus on to highlight essential learning and leadership capabilities to assist in leadership development. Um, and we're now looking at the fourth dimension, which is ownership um, within the webinar series. And as you can see, this is made up of 12 components. Um, and these have quite close interdependencies between them um, and also have interdependencies between elements of the other dimensions. Um, and it's important to know that great leaders uh, take responsibility for their own actions and interactions and they use their initiative, they're decisive, uh, solve problems continually, learn, and they're also known for their reliability. Um, in today's webinar, we're exploring the element of time management. Um, and it's important to know that leaderships can maximize their impact through effective and efficient time management. Um, and you know, we're all faced with the finite amount of time within the working week to get things done. So it's important for us as leaders and as managers to, to know how to use that time well. So in this webinar, we're going to look at time management in terms of three elements. First, we'll look at focus, then we'll look at prioritization, and then we'll go on to discuss procrastination. Um, so as I said previously, we've got a finite amount of time and we want to make the most of it to be both effective and ensure that we do the right things and also be efficient so we know we're doing those things well. And you know, in this digital revolution we're going through at the moment, we're faced under greater demands um, on our time and more distractions. And it can be quite challenging to juggle between different priorities, different work streams, and all this busyness that's going on around us. So it's really important that we can make the most of our time. Um, and as I said, it's it, Time management is closely interlinked with other elements of ownership, things like decision making, learning, um, and it's also a key element to be able to collaborate well with others, which we, we discuss it later on in the series in our fifth domain. So, um, as you were told, I used to be a research scientist, um, and I think a lot of my own personal time management skills um, evolved when I worked in this research lab running multiple experiments in parallel um, on equipment that was in short demand, shared and booked for limited periods of times. And I ran uh, quite complicated experiments over 72 hours of imaging, I used a microscope, and it took me at least four days to do the pre preparation for that. And the planning, because I was working with live tissue, was about three weeks in it. So we're talking about four to five weeks um, of, of work to get one research outcome and with strict protocols and trying to break it down into smaller steps to be as efficient as I could because the experiment day um, when I set up these was 16 hours at least when I started well it was 18 hours when I started and so pulling that back looking at different steps breaking it down analyzing was a really important skill that I took into um, my first management role when I shifted from education so I was research scientist teacher and then um, in research management and in the first first role one of the things that my team was doing when I was first manager was a lot of high um, high throughput data entry um, and a lot of that was manual and I found that there was a lot of errors um, the 
systems, the spreadsheets, and, and was poorly designed. So there was a lot of time waste in there, very time consuming. Uh, the quality assurance steps then took a lot of time because it was error prone, um, lots of mistakes made, and some of this was financial data, and some of it was also very high profile um, front facing data for the organizations in terms of our operations. So, and it took an extraordinary amount of time. So I worked with my team um, and used some of the techniques that I'll discuss during this webinar to look out with them really at what was going on. Um, and one of the first things was encouraging breaks so that they reduced their error rate because they weren't as fatigued from doing it, but also changing the formats, changing how they did things. And again, it was working very closely. It wasn't prescriptive, you will do this. It was working very closely with the people um, to, to improve efficiencies and hit our targets. Um, and it, it really helped us manage the six standard program of work that we had and also take on board some other complex projects and programs of work that we, we, we ended up doing that were, were quite high profile around um, digital innovation as well. Um, so that brings us on to thinking about how we analyze how we spend our time. And there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there um, on the internet that helps us think about how we spend our time and helps us map that out. Um, and on, on in front of us, we've got um, quite a straightforward mapping tool. And the key to this is not overcomplicating it. Um, you want to kind of get an idea of what your what activities you're spending your time on and what time you're spending on those activities, but you don't want to be spending a huge a lot of huge amount of time in doing that mapping itself because that wastes time in itself. But it's really important to kind of step back. You can do this for maybe a week or so, um, and then you can get an idea of where your time is being spent, and then you can go on to think about how you can change that and reallocate. And if you've got things that are taking particularly excessive amount of times, processes, you can then go on to use other tools. Um, I quite like Visio, where I've got multi-step processes with multi-people involved, so I can map out in little boxes what's going on and then look for efficiencies in there. Um, but start simple. Um, we've got a URL on here. This link will come out in the uh, package you get from the webinar. And it's got a link to various tools. So there's things that um, if you're writing will stop you, will cover your screen so you're not distracted by things like emails. Um, there's toolkits um, that support time management like the one on the screen in front of you. Um, there are things that will block social media. Be careful if you use these because some of them, if you're using Google Docs, will block that as one of my friends found at the start of this week and then had three hours where she couldn't do the work she needed to do with quite a tight deadline. So, so watch out for, for the other things that they might do. Um, and there's also, you know, with the digital age, we've got macros, we've got um, programs you can set up that are quite simple to interact with that can do your tasks quite a bit quicker than the manual time with quite a, le a lower level of error. So there's, there's all sorts of stuff available to help you with that. Um, so moving on from thinking about focus, thinking about a bit more about prioritization. Um, when you're looking at what you're doing, maybe using the previous toolkit, um, it's important to know, am I doing the right thing? Are the choices I'm making the right things to do? Um, and you know, have you said yes when really you should have said no? I've been guilty of that a lot in the past and I've shifted. Um, and so if there's something that comes my way that's new and I've got deadlines and I'm kind of thinking, OK, is this either something I should be doing or is this something that's actually that urgent? I try and make sure I have a discussion with the person who's asking me to do it that, that understands that task a bit better. Um, understands who else has the skills to do it. Am I the best person? Um, what's the flow through of it? Um, you know, there's all sorts of questions you can ask. And I say, for me, the hardest thing is to say no. Um, but I've, I've learned on that. And it's about how you interact with people and a maybe or a can we discuss it. And having that pragmatic conversation is the ideal way forward. It can be very difficult, particularly when you're managing upwards to senior senior managers. And I would refer you to our Managing Upwards webinar to a little bit more on that. Um, you know, we're under pressure, we're very hectic. Um, 
So that can just mean us saying yes to things we shouldn't be saying yes to because it's just easy. It gets someone moving out of our way so we can get on. Um, quite often there's someone else who can do something. Um, I think the hardest thing I've had to face is saying no to a senior board member. And I remember a particular very high profile piece of work I did when I worked at the Royal College of General Practitioners. Um, and this was um, working with some of the most senior people, decision makers in the UK in healthcare um, around the digital record access and elements of digital record access. I remember one of the um, people we had working on one of our committees came up to me at the end of a meeting um, about lunchtime and said, I need a document for the meeting I'm going to tomorrow. And my response was, well, we haven't got that in a document. And we'd had previous before this, we got to this point of the project internally because it was a really sensitive thing. We'd had a real discussion, real lengthy discussion about a sign off process to make sure that anything that went out to other organisations or could go public had proper review. So we didn't put ourselves at risk. Um, so in this document would have needed to go via my line manager to his line manager to our PR team and also to the overall chair of the organisation. And doing that for the next morning just was not going to happen. So I had to then have this discussion with this person who really wasn't very happy and say, no, I can't do this. Um, and it was kind of accepted um, begrudgingly, but there wasn't, you know, my hands were tied. There were the, uh, also, I was in meetings, so I couldn't actually write what they needed to have anyway. Um, so, you know, it, is, it can be uncomfortable, but sometimes you have to do it. Um, and again, if you're talking about difficult conversations and, and things like this, then we will in the future be looking at stakeholder management. So some of this will come into the communications element, stakeholder management, and some of the next elements of the dimensions we'll look at. Um, so things, questions about are we making the right choices to um, this nice uh, matrix that we've got in front of us, which I find really useful to think about. Um, ideally, we want to have the majority of the work we're doing in the nice green, non-urgent space that is important things that are about delivering the vision, outcome and mission of our organisation. Quite often, it's very, very easy to get wrapped up in um, the, the non-important things. Um, we get interruptions, non-important, urgent things, interruptions, calls, mails, meetings, pressing matters. Um, you know, there's the, or we get wrapped up in even the non-urgent, non-important things that just get in our way of getting on. Um, the other area that I think is I think is quite interesting is this urgent, important area. And again, I find in a lot of um, organisations I've worked worked in, a lot of things become urgent, important, where if you manage the time or the people working with you manage the time, they could be shifted to, to non-urgent spaces. Um, I found this as a teacher when I had to do reports and often I get one, no, one two days notice that the reports were due because someone in the chain of information hadn't told me, hadn't passed that information. But as a manager, when, I'm, when, I, was talk, when I was thinking about internal reports and external reports for the organisation that are demonstrating the value of money, the impact or just key information that we really need to get out, um, I found when I first started in one of the organisations that I would have ran what seemed like random ad hoc requests for things that were regular reports. And I kind of looked at this and kind of looked at the pattern and said, you know, why am I getting one day's notice for something that's going to take me a day to do um, on this notice? So with my team, I did two things. The first thing was once we understood the type of information we needed, um, as we went through and did our business as usual activity um, to deliver, we extracted that information and put it in one place so we could just pick it out as and when we needed to use it. The other thing I did was look at the chain of information above me um, and identified when those things had to be sent out and who had to see them at what points before that um, and or be involved in providing information um, and put timeframes in place so that we were ready and waiting when we got the request rather than having one day to do it. Reduce the stress significantly. Um, and you know, this applies not just for, for reporting, but a lot of other activities that we get in our day to day. 
um, where some of us end up scrabbling around. But with a bit of thinking and time management, we can shift things from urgent to, um, to non-urgent. Um, and also the other thing that I would strongly recommend around the urgent, important, is when you're doing your time planning is put um, elements into your time planning that is for absorbing those urgent things you can't anticipate. There'll always be something that's urgent you can't anticipate. So map in one or two hours that you can deal with that stuff. And if something urgent doesn't come up, that's great because you can get on and get ahead with your non-urgent tasks. Um, so where are we going? Uh, priority setting. So again, it's really important to know what is the most important thing I need to do right now and what things can I leave till later, particularly when we get very, very bogged down um, in work. Um, and that happens again, that can happen a lot. You know, we've got lots of things going on um, and it can be very easy to lose sight of the big picture outcomes and what you need to do in those elements that kind of take you through to meet those big picture outcomes. So start by making a list of what those those pieces of work are and the key outcomes. Break down the tasks that enable you to achieve them and then you can rank them. And this system we've got on the screen um, is an ABC. So A is something that is really important, really high priority, maybe high risk and has a kind of quite tight dead fr uh, time frame around it. Um, B is maybe either lower risk or lower urgency and C are the, the, the lower you know, the, the lowest priority that you can put off, move around and shift. So it's a really helpful tool and there's variations on this. I sometimes use a rag scale, uh, red, amber, green, and particularly like it when I can shift things from red to green. Um, and I use spreadsheets to help me order and sequence this as well. Um, if you want to go a bit more, more technical, there's loads of tools out there you can go and search for. Um, this is a good starting point. Um, and you just, you know, you break it down, do one thing at a time and don't get distracted by trying to do too many things at once and trying to multitask. Um, so thinking about the next thing is procrastination. Everyone I know procrastinates in some way at some time. Um, it's human nature. You know, sometimes we stop and that's OK, but we need to then overcome it if we start procrastinating and recognise if we start procrastinating. Um, you know, we can avoid things because we're, we're anxious about it. Um, maybe the task is overwhelming or maybe we find the task less interesting than other things or um, and this can be counterproductive, be guilt, shame, and it can impact on your the way you, you interact with other people in the workplace. So it's important to be able to recognise the symptoms. We've got quite a bit on this slide. Uh, I'm not going to dwell in detail across the board, but maybe if there's particular areas you recognise in yourself or your colleagues and you want to discuss or ask questions, maybe you can drop that into the discussion box and we can pick up and discuss them um, a bit later. Um, as Nick said at the start, I've recently finished my MBA and I did that while well, I've been working full time. I was part time studying. And I found a lot of people in, in my study group put on a lot of tasks until the last minute. Um, so they rushed their assignments, poor quality, late, didn't do themselves justice. Um, and one of the techniques that was recommended by one of the colleagues, which is something I've done variations of myself, um, was the Pomodoro technique. And essentially, you work intensely for 25 minutes, you take a break. Um, and then you go back and work intensely for another 25 minutes. And it's really good just to kind of plow through something um, and to manage that time and to make progress. And you set yourself targets and rewards in that. Um, and again, it's something that he brought from his business um, um, perspective as a project manager into the learning space. Um, the other thing I find is sometimes just getting started is a bit of a challenge. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, again, if there's anything else on this that you want to look at, drop it and discuss, drop it into the chat box and we'll pick it up in a moment. The effects of procrastination, they're quite obvious. Um, poor quality, stress, late, um, your personal brand and reputation and the brand and reputation of your organisation as well. Um, disappointment of others, um, losing opportunities. So it is important to be able to recognise and overcome it. Um, and the first thing I would say, which I said before, is forgive yourself. Everyone does it. If you start wrapping yourself in knots because you've been procrastinating, you'll go nowhere fast. 
but also I find giving myself rewards really helps um, depending on what the task is it might be something like I really like raspberries so I might have a snack of raspberries afterwards I might um, give myself a task I really enjoy afterwards and reward myself by doing the thing that is going to make me really excited and that's my motivator um, I might, you know, I might, I might give myself a walk away. You know, sometimes you need to stop, although it seems counterproductive. Sometimes you need to stop, walk away, and come back. Um, again, I'm not going to dwell on a lot of detail on these because there's quite a lot around here. But the other thing I find is sometimes it can be really hard for me to get started um, on tasks if I find them complicated that I've not done that type of thing before and I remember the first time I wrote a briefing paper for the House of Lords it was something I didn't know how to do I'd not done policy papers before so I had to kind of I didn't know where to start I started procrastinating but what I did was I sat there and decided okay I'm just going to burn all the information on this topic on a sheet of paper it took about six pages um, I got started I wrote it up and then I condensed it back into my two-page briefing paper um, with the essentials on it and it was just about getting started and not being overwhelmed because it was something new um, so and the other thing that is that I find really helpful again when I get stuck is the um, the long-term goal why is that important um, and what am I going to achieve through it and that then helps me break down the other elements that maybe I find more challenging um, there's hundreds of techniques around um, that that talk about procrastination and how to avoid procrastination, overcome it. Um, some of them sit in our spotlights as well. So, so I'd recommend looking at those when you get uh, the, the email out after the webinar. Um, and it's all about practice. You know, as you build up your ability with this, um, you develop more skills, it becomes a natural process. So the more experience, the more you do, the more techniques you try, the easier it becomes to, to improve your time management. Um, I'm just gonna show a very short amount of this clip, um, but hopefully that this will give you some food for thought when I bring it up on the screen. It's painful to understand how much of what you're doing isn't productive. So I'll give you an example. So. I've done this a couple of times with a classroom full of students. Usually when I'm lecturing about career development, I say, okay, um, how much time do you waste? So then I get the class to vote. How many of you waste uh, 10 hours a day? It's like 10% of the kids will put up their hands. And it's interesting because I don't define what constitutes waste. I just ask the question. So they're diagnosing themselves, right? I'm not saying you're wasting 10 hours a day. I'm just asking. It's like, given your own attitude, how much time are you wasting? 10 hours a day, it's like 10% of the people put up their hands. Well, when you get to like six hours a day, 80% of the people put up their hands. So then we do the arithmetic. Like, I like doing arithmetic with people. People hate arithmetic, but I like doing it. It's like, okay, six hours a day. It's 42 hours a week. So let's call that a work week, 40 hours a week. So so that's that's a work week. Let's say, what's your time worth? You're a university student. Well, it's certainly worth minimum wage, because obviously, but it's worth way more than that, because... If you spend a productive hour when you're 20, then you gain the benefits of that hour for the rest of your life. So there's a compounding effect of time spent when we were young. So I say, well, let's assume your time's worth 50 bucks an hour, which I think is an underestimate, but whatever. Let's call it 50. We call it 25. We'll call it 50. That's $2,000 a week you're wasting. It's $100,000 a year. It's like, how much better would your life be if you weren't wasting $100,000 a year? It's like, what is that over 40 years? So that's just a little bit of food for thought for you. And again, the, the, the full link, if you want to see the full clip, that is in the package that we sent out in the slides at the end of the session. Um, I just want to highlight, I take a moment to highlight that um, all the content we've got here is drawn from research um, and evidence. And um, we've got the references that if you want to go and do some more reading, you can go and look these up after the session um, when you get the email out. Um, and and finally, I want to to thank you and hand over to Nick for the questions. Arwin, oh, many excellent, many thanks. Um, I think the, the the sound was good on the video, but I think the the video was a little bit out. But we, I, I certainly heard the sound fine. Um, just a few questions. Maybe the first one is around multitasking because you talked about multitasking, mm -hmm. and, and 
maybe to just sort of sum up the questions around that is is it really possible to multitask or are you saying you know stop do one thing at a time that's a really difficult question and it's something there's been a lot of research and the research is is mixed and from my experience in the research I'd, I, I've seen I would say generally if you try multitask too much and do too many things at once your brain's going to get in a fuzz and you're not going to get there it's better particularly when you've got got really complex deadlines just to focus on that one thing at once um, get it done, then move on. That's an efficient way of managing it. It's a much more efficient way of managing it. So, um, and again, if while you're doing that task, you might have um, thoughts that relate to something else that's on your plate. So keep a notepad. I keep, I keep a notepad on the computer. I use the note functions on my computer so that if I find that my brain is starting to wander and I start to multitask when I really shouldn't be, I'll just write it down so I don't forget forget it and come back to it. And that maintains my focus. Um, and there are times where you do need to deal with multiple things at once, depending on the complexity of the activity you're doing. So, for instance, you know, in a lab space, I would have one activity going at one time and another activity having to run simultaneously that would have. Um, but again, what I did, and it's something I've taken into the, the business space, into the management space, is say, OK, yes, I've got this activity over here that I need to do. It interrelates with this activity here I need to do. So I'll pull that information across. So technically that might be multitasking, but at the same time, I compartmentalise it and keep the focus where it needs to be. Right. Um, you you talk quite a lot about different tools that are available mm -hmm. and ranking and so on. Um, yeah. And it, it, this all seems it seems quite quite a manual process. Yeah, I go and I fill in a time, I fill in a spreadsheet and so on. Is yeah. there is there anything that we can use to automate this or make it more you know um, more systemized as we go through and really get that best practice where we can use um, well I don't know automation, artificial intelligence, that sort of thing to just really help us to 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 become more effective. Um, I tend, I'm a trained project manager and I tend to use a lot of project management tools for that type of thing. So um, one of the things I will sometimes use, particularly if things get particularly very busy, is, is I'll, I'll, I'll use my Gantt charts. Obviously, you know, that, that's the kind of staple of project management. But the other thing is I do, I do a very simple version of that where I've got a spreadsheet that has the list of the, the tasks in one place. And it's got the deadline date next to it and accountability kind of somewhere in that spreadsheet. And then I can sequence those tasks by the deadline date. And it just sorts it for me in terms of when I need to do the tasks. And I can do that kind of green prioritise. You know, I can, I can make it a bit more complicated um, if I want to. Um, so when you start out, keep it as simple as possible if you're not used to using these tools, because it does take, you know, you can get wrapped up and waste a lot of time in trying to get a handle on what the tools do and how they work. Um, but once you've got used to using them, then you can get iteratively slightly more sophisticated in them. Um, you know, right. I'm, I'm quite used to handling data and spreadsheets. So but I've, I've had colleagues when I've given them my toolkits that they found them just that they just waste too much time on trying to use them because it's not their comfort zone. So right. it's a very personal thing. But yeah, put, if it's, it's easy to put something into a spreadsheet, put your task into a spreadsheet, give it a ranking number and a date number and sequence it. And then build um, from there. Yeah. And then you just, can go on to more sophisticated. Okay. One, one final question, which is you, we hear a lot about work-life balance, yeah, and how important mm -hmm. that is. And I think you've talked almost exclusively about work type things how does how does one um put in personal priorities as it were into this you know i'm trying to manage my time how do you yeah. manage sort of work and personal priorities um that's a very it's a very good question and again you have to think about i've got a finite amount of time to do whatever it is i'm doing um and one of the things for me that i found i i to a session, I told her I was just going to learn to marathon, and I'm not a runner, and it was really tough. And not only was the marathon tough, it was tough for me to manage my work life. Oh, not my work bit, but the life balance in terms of getting myself out of training in the winter we've just had, where with minus, you know, going into the minus degrees in snow and stuff. But it was about for me, it was about kind of setting up the steps that got me to somewhere where I would go out for that run. 
So I kind of throughout the day put on the bits of clothing. So then when it got to six or seven o'clock, I really didn't want to go out in the cold. I was there ready to do it. And, you know, it's about putting things in place that, that reward you and enable you to do it and learning how to say no as well. You know, it's very, very easy with a lot of pressure on you to be have stuff that piles on top of you in the work where that starts impeding on your life. Um, and I got much better at that when I did the MBA because I was having to spend, you know, I compress my work hours down so I could spend the time doing the study because it, it's a huge commitment, you know, do, yeah. doing that at once. And again, it's about breaking things down and accepting there is only a finite amount of time and being clear when you're managing upwards and managing downwards and managing your stakeholder relationships, letting people know the expectations that they can have of you and what you can achieve within that time frame. And if something changes, you know, things do change, being clear and transparent about that and learning different ways to say no, maybe not saying no outright because people aren't palatable for that, but finding ways to negotiate around that. Um, I, I would say um, okay. it's a very woolly topic, uh, so, um, but it's about, it's about those people interactions. Then I think uh, in terms okay. of backwards. Uh, Arwen, I'm afraid we're, we're out of time. It's very important we finish on time, given especially given this topic. So I'd like to thank you for your for your presentation for, and for um, for dealing with our questions, and thank everyone who who submitted a question today. Um, on behalf of the Institute of Leadership and Management, um, I'd like to thank Arwin again for a, for her excellent presentation and, and congratulations on running the London Marathon. It's a really, really excellent achievement. Um, I'm going to close the webinar now. Uh, thank everyone and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot.